So, so expired listings. So, um, Mike, I'm actually recording it now. I just hit the record button. So the little announcement there at the beginning didn't get recorded, but the, um, the rest did. But, um, so we're talking about expireds. Anybody calling expireds already? Raise your hand, raise your hand, put a comment, um, on Facebook. Yes, I'm calling expireds. No, I'm not. And I'll tell you what, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments, go ahead and drop them in the comments on Facebook, because what we'll do is we'll get to those as we're going through that. Some of them I probably am already going to answer for you. Some of them maybe, you know, I don't know, but if you ask, I'll be glad to answer it, tell you what my experience is and tell you how, what my clients are doing that works, right? What my expired clients are doing, let's work and, and what I've done in my real estate career. Um, gosh, we're approaching 20 years rapidly. Um, but what I've been doing, that worked where I've pretty much called expires for years and years. And um, I had somebody ask me, they said, hey, well, uh, does calling expires and for sale owners, does that actually work? And I said, well, you know what? I made enough money that, um, I mean, gosh, we paid off our house in three years. We've, uh, you know, we've got a lot of stuff. We bought a lot of real estate and all that stuff was financed with money that was made from actually getting out there and physically, you know, making calls. So, I mean, um, you know, so uh, that is what, I mean, that's what it is, you know? So guys, I feel like, um, I feel like it's really worth doing. I feel like it's worth your time. So here we are. Let's talk about the problems first. And one of the biggest problems I see in the real estate business that a lot of agents have is this is not the movies. Okay. So what they, what they see is they see these guys like Wolf of Wall Street's a great example. We're, we're all, if you're in the real estate industry, I know you're a fan of sales movies and we all see these sales movies and you know what? They're on the phone. They're, um, they're on the phone and they are doing a call and they have stuff going on. And, um, anyway, all of a sudden that person goes from not being a believer to being a hardcore believer and they do it like in the blink of an eye. It's like it's Leonardo DiCaprio and Wolf of Wall Street will deliver an amazing line. And all of a sudden, like I said, that person goes from being a non-believer to an extreme believer and they do it almost immediately. Right. And then they buy whatever Leonardo DiCaprio wants. Right. So a lot of agents and a lot of salespeople in general, they see this happen in the movies. Right. And they see these lines and they see these great lines and stuff. And then they think that's going to happen to them. They think there's a magic bullet. They think there's a secret word, right? A secret phrase, whatever it might be. But guys, there's not, there's not. And I feel like a lot of these movies that we, we love as salespeople, they ruin us for the real estate world <laughs> because this is truly a relationship game. And sometimes, sometimes I got an interview I did with um, Daryl Self the other day. That's going to be on um, YouTube here in a few days. And um, one of the things he talked about was a listing he just took and where he followed up with the person. He physically followed up, I think, 24 or 25 times before he actually went and listed the property. And sometimes it takes that sort of follow up. Now, the second biggest problem I see that agents do, and I see this all the time, too, is they make it too complicated right? They make it so complicated, actually. They make it so complicated that they just can't get from point A to point B. And lots of times with that being complicated like that, the more complicated you make it, the harder it's going to be for you to actually go out and do it. You know, and a lot of agents, what they'll have is they have 10, they have 10 moving parts. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do this. And they have all this stuff going on. And, um, Man, and it just don't work because they got too much going on and they get busy and that, that real elaborate system they, they made, they get really busy and then parts of that system start falling out, right? Or they get a little strapped for cash and part of that system falls out and just doesn't work, right? So that's the second biggest problem I see agents do is they just make it too complicated. So let's talk about what exactly is an expired. Does anybody want to volunteer for me and tell 
what you think the definition is. So I'll go ahead and start since nobody was that quick. Um, so we can get on with it. But an expired is exactly what we think it is. It's a listing that was on MLS where the contract with that agent, the listing agreement with that agent expired. And now it's no longer on the market. So that's all it is. Right? I want to make sure we're all on the same page with that. And expired is just a listing where the where the agreement has expired with an agent or ended with an agent, and now it's not on the market anymore. That's what expired is. So why do listings expire? I think this is really important. We talk about this because a lot of agents I talk to about expired listings, they constantly go, oh, well, well, it, it was overpriced. It was all overpriced. But guys, this is not always the case. So I wrote a book. I wrote a book, if any of you are interested, it's on Amazon, it's called How to Be an Expired Master. And um, I took some things out of that book and put it in this webinar we're doing tonight, but it, it goes in depth. It's about an hour and a half, two hour read, so it's kind of quick and it's a full expired system in there. So, but why do listings expire? Now, this was something I, I come up with thinking about it, you know? 10 reasons they expire. Number one's bad pictures. And number two is a bad description. So I'm gonna tell you guys about, about one thing that I had previously. I listed a condo, this was a few years ago, I listed a condo, I'm on the phone with the lady and I like to have Red X up and then I like to have you know, MLS up so I can look at MLS real quick and look up things real quick. Well, as I'm talking to her, she's telling me about this has been done and that's been done and all this stuff. And, um, and uh, anyway, I'm looking at the pictures and none of this stuff's been done in the pictures. And finally, the big thing that set, set it off was she said there was granite countertop, countertops. Well, I'm looking in the pictures and the cabinets look old, man. And there's no granite countertops. And she's telling me these are basically new. And Luigi, I'll get to that in just a second. If you don't have expired, so you just keep listening. I got, I got some solutions for you. But anyway, as I'm talking to her, I realized that um, either I got the wrong listing pulled up or these are the wrong pictures. So finally, I, I tell her, I said, hey, uh, you know, I know this is you. It's got the same last name, but I'm looking at the MLS. Can I send it over to you? Because I think the agent you had previously, I think they made a mistake because um, right here I'm looking and, um, and it's not, um, I mean, it doesn't, I don't see the stuff you're telling me. So I don't see the stuff you're telling me. And uh, anyway, I ended up sending it over the agent she had previously. Man, the place looked like it was grossly overpriced. As a redone unit, we, we ended up listing it, get a contract 30 days, selling her, selling her house. Actually, I listed $10,000 higher than the last agent. And I sold it. Right? So, I mean, bad pictures and a bad description. It happens all the time. It happens to the best of us, honestly. You know, um, I had one a while back, too, that um, the girl called me up and she talked to me about selling her house. It had been listed for six months with another agent, or maybe it was three months, but it had been listed with another agent. And she's telling me about a three bedroom, two bath with a garage, and I'm pulling up the listing and stuff. I'm pulling up her old listing and I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, um, did she tell me I had a garage or not? Because the previous listing did not have it listed anywhere in it, and it didn't have, I didn't see any pictures of the garage, no mention of the garage or anything. So I call her, and looking at it, it looked like it was way overpriced, right? as a three bedroom, two bath without a garage, it was crazy priced. With a garage, it wasn't that bad. So I call her up and I say, hey, look, um, hey, look, did you tell me I had a garage? And she's like, yeah, it does. And, I, and she, then she goes, yeah, we got a sunroom we added too. Well, I'm looking at MLS and it has neither one of these things. And anyway, long story short with that, when I ended up listing it, we put the garage on there, sold really quick and she sold her house. I mean, but she'd paid, God, three or six months worth of mortgage payments, um, more than what she probably intended to on that house because the agent was just negligent, had bad pictures, a bad description. So number three, we, I feel like we've all had this one too. We've all had that place that was hard to show, hard to get into. The seller didn't, didn't want you in there, the, um, or it had tenants in it, right? It's hard to show, I had to give a 24 hour notice. Um, yeah, Mike, I'll be glad to, man. I'll send it out after it's done. Um, but, you know, it was just difficult to get into. And, um, and we just couldn't show it, right? I had one one time that this seller, I mean, this buyer I was representing, he was just hooked on this house. 
This was the only house he was interested in. I showed him the one four doors down, exact same damn house, even the same colors on the inside. But for whatever reason, he liked the position of this particular lot better. I mean, this guy, he was real detailed and he talked about the way the sun was going to sun was going to go down on the back porch versus the one down the street. And I mean, which I get it, you know, Hey, you want what you want. Right. So, but, but I mean, this kind of ties in number three and four kind of ties in together, but we couldn't get in the place. We couldn't get in the place. We tried like four days in a row and the agent went and answered his phone. The agent wasn't getting back to us. And um, finally, I mean, the place was sitting empty. And I mean, we'd already walked around and looked through the windows. I mean, this guy was like stalking the place out. I think he was sitting in the driveway waiting for somebody to show up. Finally, like a week later, the agent calls me back and he's like, hey, man, uh, yeah, the house is available. And fortunately, this guy trusted me enough that he made an offer on the house, basically sight unseen, contingent on him inspecting. And we ended up getting it under contract. But, you know, a lot of other buyers would have moved on. Think about how many buyers that's, that agent had already lost because of that, right? Because not answering his phone at the end show. So there's a lot of stuff like, hey, they got some tenants in there. The tenants won't allow it to be shown. Um, hey, we just evicted some that um, they wouldn't allow anybody to go into the unit to make repairs unless it was somebody they actually knew and recommended to make repairs, right? So you see kind of funky stuff sometimes, right? And number five, number five, um, difficult agent. It just got an agent. Sometimes I feel like agents don't quite understand what our job is and what our role is. Our role is to represent the seller. Our role is, you know what, sometimes, sometimes we get caught up in, we get caught up in, um, in well, I don't get caught up in it. A lot of you guys don't, but we see agents get caught up in it. They think, they act like the house is theirs, right? They go, they're doing what they want to do, right? rather do what the seller wants to do. Um, sometimes it gets really, really, really funky, right? And the agent is looking out for themselves, not their client. So, um, so we see a lot of stuff like that in the real estate business, I feel like, that just kind of prevents it. I mean, we've all seen the old agent thing. I had one a while back where I was interested in a piece of property. And I talked to the sellers before they put it on the market. I was interested in myself. I went trying to list it. And we, we specifically discussed one. It was a large piece of property, a little mobile home on the side of it. I specifically discussed with the sellers what I was willing to offer. I discussed an offer with them on that property. Um, well, for some reason, couldn't get back and forth with, touch with them. We seemed to be on the same page. Didn't get in touch with them. And, um, Anyway, next thing I know, I drove by and there's a sign in the front. I said, well, you know, maybe they just wasn't interested in my offer. So I'm literally walking around Walmart one day. The lady sees me and she basically goes, hey, Jason, look, you know, we listed that with an agent, but, you know, we're still interested in the offer you gave us. We just didn't hear back from you. And for whatever reason, I guess, you know, I don't know, but we just didn't get back in touch with each other. Right. So I called their agent up and they said, hey, um, you know, we got it listed right now. And I said, well, you know, I'm an agent too. I got to call the agent. And anyway, so, you know, trying to do the right thing. I didn't want to go around that agent. I called the agent up and talked to the agent about the offer that I'd made. Tell her previously, told her I saw your clients in Walmart. They told me to give you a call that I should submit that offer through you. And um, next thing I know, man, I get a way different response than the response I'd got standing in Walmart talking to the lady. And I still believe that place is still listed. It's been listed for like a year with this agent. And I've talked to the agent several times. I've adjusted my offer some. And I feel like that agent is thinking they should get what she thinks she wants, not what they're, they told me they want, which, well, you know, is a weird situation to be in anyway. But sometimes, guys, we do have those difficult sellers. We get the sellers that, hey, they want to net, they want to net $78,000 and they don't want to net a penny less than 78,000. So if the contract's coming in and it's going to net them 79,900, they are not interested in that, right? We see that too. And hey, sometimes you just got a seller that is 100% unmotivated and they just have their own agenda and a hundred bucks is not going to, a hundred bucks isn't probably going to kill any of us on most of these real estate transactions, but I've seen deals get held up for a couple hundred bucks, right? 
and I've had deals where, Hey, we were so close, man. You call the other agent up and say, Hey, look, man, we're got 250 bucks. I'll go half. If you go half, right. We've seen that you have to make a business decision. Um, but sometimes that seller kills deals. Number seven acts of God. Um, Number seven is acts of God. And you know what? Sometimes, man, sometimes, I mean, like we had a hurricane here a couple of weeks ago. It's hard to get title insurance wrote. We've had the coronavirus. I mean, we've all, if, if you want to see acts, what would be considered acts of God, you know, according to your state law or real estate contracts or whatever, man, 2020 has been full of acts of God. I mean, it's, it's unreal, you know, but we've seen coronavirus kill a bunch of deals. We've seen, um, you know, hurricanes, earthquakes, we, it seems like you can think of it. We've saw it murder hornets and everything. And sometimes something happens, the deal falls through and the listing just expires. It's not the agent's fault. It's not the seller's fault. You know, just something happened and it just didn't work out. Right. Sometimes something happens. It don't work out but the seller blames the agent. Right. I mean, Hey, I've had that happen before. Hey, I had one, one time where a guy, um, he, um, I pull up at his house and he's got this amazing driveway that goes from the front, the side of the house through this amazingly landscaped thing to a three car garage. And I'm standing there talking to him. We're talking about this thing. We're putting, we're, we're actually signing listing paperwork. And I told him, I said, well, you got this big lot here. And he goes, Oh, well, it's half an acre. And I'm looking at it. And I'm going, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. This is way more than half an acre, right? This is like probably an acre and a half. And I said, wow, that's, uh, you know, I thought it was bigger with the driveway. And he goes, well, the driveway is not included. I said, what? He goes, yeah, the driveway goes across my mama's land. I said, what, what, wait a minute, wait a minute. And the way he built the driveway, it kind of, the way he built the driveway, it kind of messed up the way the, the garage set. And long story short is you couldn't drive down, you know, if you cut off the driveway, there was no way for you to really get in the garage. It was really funky. It made the house basically backwards. And um, dude, and somehow or another, I told him, I said, hey, look, we can't get this price without this driveway, without that. You know, it's gonna make it, it's gonna be an awkward house and I just don't think you can get it. Like that's gonna be a big, big problem. And, um, and I mean, he had a ditch in front of his house and you couldn't even get to the, technically you cut off the driveway and the lot with the driveway, you couldn't even get to his house. Right. And um, I ended up listing it. It ended up expired. It wasn't my fault. It was the fault of his. He had this amazing uh, driveway that nobody could get to. Right. Uh, nobody could get to the garage from that without the driveway. So number eight, pets. Pets. I, I listed a house one time. It was a little three bedroom, two bath. It was out in Conway, South Carolina. It had been listed when I talked to the lady doing my research before I went over there. I realized it had been listed three times previously. It, been listed at pretty much the same price I'd kind of like talked to her about on the phone. Long story short, man, I was racking my brain about this going, um, going, Hey, you know, why has this house not sold? Right. Why has it not sold? What is the deal with this? And, um, anyway, I pull up at her house for the appointment and I'm about to get out of my car. And next thing I know, this giant dog comes around the house. He was, uh, I think he was a bull massive mixed with horse, right? Um, this dog's head was as big as my steering wheel. This thing was just a massive animal. And he gets out. Well, he comes around the corner and I go to get out and this dog does not look friendly at all. Right? He actually looked like he could have torn my leg off with no problems. He looked like I could have put a saddle on him and rode him. He looked like a small pony. He was that big. And this thing is, looks like he's ferocious. I, I get back in my car, I call her and I said, Hey, this is Jason. Just want to let you know I'm outside. I didn't know if your dog was friendly or not. Well, she comes outside, gets the dog. Turns out this dog's like a sweetheart. He's like a teddy bear. However, this dog was so big. He was carrying around in his mouth, a partially deflated basketball and kept bumping me in the back of my leg with it. Want me to play with it. Now, not only did we have this dog, we had piles of dog poop in the, in the um, house that looked like a bear had pooped in her living room, right? So we take a tour of the house. There's no major problems, no issues. It's a little bit older house, but you know, nothing unreasonable. The price she wanted was extremely fair price for it. And I'm talking to her and I said, hey, you have this house listed a couple times before. Why do you think you didn't sell with other agents? 
and she makes a comment. She goes, she goes, oh, well, people would pull up in the yard, then they would turn around and leave. And that was when it hit me. They were turning around and leaving because this giant dog. And so, um, so as soon as she said that, it kind of clicked for me. And I'll tell you guys the truth. Like, hey, you know what? I'm usually good with dogs. Dogs usually like me. Um, even the mean dogs usually like me. However, in this situation, I would have been scared for my clients to get out. If they would have been sitting in the back seat of my car, I'd have been scared for them to get out because of the dog. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's unfortunate, but, uh, we put our, we talked about the dog and we put our house on the market and long story short, um, her house sold, sold quickly. So, I mean, sometimes that happens. And I think, I think we'd be surprised to know how many times that happens. Um, number nine, uh, number nine, I'll tell you guys about one I had. It was a double wide out listed. And man, we had this thing listed cheap. We had it listed for forty nine nine, and there were other houses in the neighborhood for like eighty thousand bucks, eighty five thousand bucks. Like this thing was priced right, right? Okay, so this is the problem, though. I went in the house, and I'm sitting in the living room talking to the people, and the dog pee or cat pee, the animal pee, some sort of pee in the house was like an overwhelming smell. I mean, I felt like I was about to choke out. Remember me talking about having asthma problems and having this old mold problems and stuff. Like I had to leave the house and go take me a minute. This thing was bad. And I told her, I said, I said, you know what? I said, maybe we get some air fresheners or something when we put this on the market. Now she knew that the place needed, needed some work. I mean, they'd done some funky like halfway jobs. And anyway, she knew the house needs some work. So we talked about it and we priced it accordingly. And we priced it really well. It's priced at 50,000 bucks when the comps were like 85. Right. So that's a good deal when you guys say. So. Um, so anyway, I mentioned this to her and she goes, oh, I was vacuuming before you came and I burned up a vacuum cleaner belt. And that's all good and everything. You know, that happens. But this wasn't a back vacuum cleaner belt. So anyway, next thing I know, they're moving out the house. They're moving to wherever they were moving to. Well, as soon as they move out, I don't know if you guys know this. When all of a sudden the fleas and stuff don't have anything to eat on, they go crazy in a house that's sitting empty. Where when the animals are there, they're not that bad. They're not that noticeable. Well, when they moved out, not only did the fleas go crazy, the roaches did too. And this house was covered in bugs. I mean, it was a scary type of thing you see like in horror movies, right? So um, long story short, I, I tell her, I say, hey, look, I got some pest control people. They're charging 100 bucks a treatment. They think there needs to be two treatments. These people didn't really have any money. I said, look, guys, I'll pay for the treatments. I just need to get reimbursed back to closing. If I can send you an email stating that you respond back to me, I'll be glad to send you all the receipts. We'll give them to the closing attorney. And, you know, that's what we'll do, right? So I'll pay a couple hundred bucks for this thing to get treated. And, guys, that's the way it should happen. When something like that needs to be done, a lot of agents will go and treat that out of their own pocket. Do not do that. It should be treated by them. Now, I don't mind doing it. Having them reimburse me as long as it's agreed upon in writing or an email, I'll do it, right? But anyway, this house, we couldn't sell it. We couldn't sell it because the damn fleas and termite. Well, the fleas and um, roaches were basically carrying people off. And um, that's what had happened before when it was listed previously. It was a home's condition. The condition was bad, man. So anyway, we ended up selling, we ended up uh, treating the termite thing and all that stuff. And they ended up accepting the offer for 45000 and we moved on. But it had expired a few times before. And that was the reason it expired. It was the condition of the home. Really, it was the fleas. So guys, sometimes, sometimes the listing agent just runs out of time. I'll tell you what, sometimes I've been really bold. Sometimes I've been really confident. I've taken those 30-day listings. Dude, I took a two-week listing before. I knew the house would go under contract quickly. Right? I took, and I've taken 30 day listings, you know what, got a contract and all of a sudden the contract fall apart. Wasn't that I did a bad job. I did my job. Just, Hey, just the stars didn't align for us sometimes. Hey, the buyers, uh, the buyers check stub didn't match up with the mortgage information, whatever it is. Right. But it fell apart. And dude, I just ran out of time, man. I mean, fortunately when I've had those situations, I've managed to get an extension and end up selling the house, but not all agents, are able to do that. Not all agents have that skill set. Not all agents are willing to ask for an extension, right? And sometimes you just run out of time. 
you know? So guys, now that we know that it doesn't all come from price, does this make sense to you guys? Give me a yes or no. Does this make sense? Price isn't the only reason things expire. And guys, just because you don't have new expires, expires that expired yesterday, that doesn't mean that you don't have old expires, right? Sometimes we can go back, I mean, we can go back years, right? I mean, guys, and get this, a lot of the things that didn't that expired, guess what they did? The people rented them out, right? And guess what's really happened across the United States is we've had this crazy thing called the coronavirus. There's a lot of people out of work, and guess what? unemployment didn't get extended for a lot of people, right? So there's a lot of people right now that don't really have any income and they're renting a place and they're not protected by these eviction things. The eviction, the eviction and uh, moratorium extensions only were for properties that had a government back loan. If it's a property owned free and clear, doesn't have an FHA, USDA, or VA loan, doesn't have a government back loan, dude, you can evict. I had six evictions last week. I got two more I'm gonna file on Monday for me, right? So there are landlords and that's, I know that some of you guys out there listening to this are going, hey, that's cold. It's not cold, it's business, right? It sucks, I don't wanna do it. But there's a lot of programs, if they call me and they're willing to, if they're willing to go fill out the information, I'm willing to sign the documents so that they can get help paying their rent. There's a lot of programs out there right now that landlords don't understand that's available. And we need to be the people letting them know how to do that. You need to figure out where that program is and what that program has going on in your market. So where does contact information come from? Now, I'm going to tell you guys this. Now, you can go out there and you can try to figure out contact information yourself. You can try to figure it out. But I'm going to be honest with you. You're not going to find many numbers, right? Because a lot of these things, for you to look up numbers on your own, they're paid nowadays. Okay, um, but there's services out there, okay? There's Red X, that's my favorite one. That's the one I rec recommend to people. Now, the reason I recommend them to people is because, man, every time I've switched from Red X, every time I've went to something else, guess what? Two, three months, I was switching back to Red X. And the reason being is because, um, the reason being is because um, it is really just, it's the best service out there. They have an algorithm and, um, you know, the algorithm works. Guys, these people are smart, right? They're mining their own data. A lot of expired services out there are not mining their own data. What they're doing is they're reselling data. They're reselling data, and lots of times it's the data that's the easy numbers to get. So you might get one or two here and there that's really easy. You might get them from whitepages.com. You might get them from switch, switchboard.com, whatever it is. But it's going to take you a lot of time. Guys, before I found a service, I'd spend three or four hours a night looking up numbers to make calls for an hour or two in the morning. Right? Red X, if you use this link, jasonmorrisredx.com, or you call them and tell them you're in real estate agents, they really work, and I sent you you'll save $150 off your setup fee. They often have some package deals. They have some stuff like that. I would recommend expireds cost 60 bucks a month for the regular plan. It costs a little bit more for the Onyx and a little bit more for the dollar. I would recommend if you're just starting, get the regular plan and a dollar. Dollar costs you a hundred bucks extra, but there's a lot of benefits in using it. Using it. But expired data is mined data. It's data that somebody went through they look through databases. I don't know where these databases are, but it's something that Red X pays to be a part of. And basically they have an algorithm that figures out the most likely numbers. Is it going to be 100% on the numbers? It is not. Okay. It's not, but you're going to get a lot of numbers and you're going to save a lot of time. And if you get the regular service, it costs you two bucks a day. Um, there's not a lot I can do for you, for anybody for two bucks a day. Right? So guys, that's where contact information comes from. Now, what exactly is the mindset of a seller? Because I feel like sometimes if we can figure out why people are doing certain things and we can wrap our head around why they're doing certain things, then um, we can figure out what we need to do on our end to help accommodate that their situation, right? Wouldn't you guys agree with that? If there's something weird going on out there, right, then we can probably if we know kind of why it's happening, 
we can probably figure out a solution to it a lot easier. So we can figure out why these sellers are, you know, I hear people say that sellers are mean to us, right? You guys have that experience, yes or no? Are sellers mean? Type sellers are mean if you think they are. Expired sellers are mean. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, if we can figure out what their mindset is a little bit, sometimes we can figure out how we can help them a little better, right? And guys, this is what I've, this is what I've seen. You know, a lot of these people, like I, I got this belief, I got this belief that a lot of the time people are selling a house. Um, people, well, people aren't selling a house because they're like, hey, honey, what you want to do this weekend? We should move. Hey, we should move across town, see what they're doing over there. You know, I don't think people are doing that. Um, hey, honey, I'm going to get one of these uh, for sale owner signs from, uh, from Walmart today when we're uh, picking up some groceries and we're just going to put it out in the front yard and see what happens. Right. People don't do that. People don't do that. It's a major decision. And lots of times their decision is based around a problem. Right. They can't afford the payment. They need to move up. They need to move down. They need to move sideways. They need to, you know, move. They need to move across town for the job. You know, whatever it is. Right. Um, but people are often selling their house because um, they feel like it's not quite big enough. I mean, we had our house on the market um, beginning of this year. And then we ended up taking off the market. But um, we, the reason we did was because, hey, we got, you know, we got, we had one child and we we're having a second child. And, you know, all of a sudden the place that we had was really big when it was just us, it was just me and Laura. But now that it's me and Laura and two kids, it isn't as big as what it was, right? We got, you know, we could have another house this big just for toys. And um, we talked about selling it. And uh, anyway, we did. But at the same time, you know, we had a problem and selling our house was a way to fix that problem, right? Now, I think that some sellers, you know, a lot of them feel angry. A lot of them feel angry. They're angry at their last agent. They're angry at agents in general. You know, they got promised the world. Let's face it. A lot of agents are going out there and they promise these agents the world or they promise these sellers the world. Hey, we can get you $1 million for your house, right? Some agents I've heard tell people whatever they wanted to hear. But in the end, they feel like they're let down. <laughs> they feel like they're let down. They feel like they've been defeated, right? They feel like their agent lied to them. They feel like all agents are lying to them. You know, they feel like they failed. Their house didn't sell. Yeah, their house is nicer than the neighbor's house down the street that sold for $10,000 more, but their house didn't sell, so it must be the agent's fault. They're angry at the agent. Agent didn't do their job. They didn't do their job. You know, husband didn't cut the grass soon enough. The wife didn't clean up. Whatever. You know, whatever it is, they feel like they're defeated. A lot of them feel like they can do better than their last agent did. Sometimes the agent screwed up, and you know, the agent didn't answer the phone. They didn't have the centralized showings correctly. They didn't do whatever it was they were supposed to do. Hey, they just didn't do what they told them they were going to do. And how many times does that happen? How many times do um, do um, um, how many times does that happen where we basically just we just don't we just don't follow through and we've all done it we've all over promised we've all um, just not done what we were supposed to do right so. It just happens. We don't mean for it to happen. It just happens, right? But, you know, guys, they're not angry at you. They're angry at the situation they're in. They're angry at the problem they have, right? That's it. So, you know, we have to, what we have to do in relation to that is we have to build our sales and we have to build our follow-up process in a way that builds trust. We have to build it in a way that builds trust and we have to have a plan, right? We have to have a plan. And a lot of agents I see making calls do not have that plan. They don't have the plan and they don't have, um, they're not sending out a pre-listing package. Their script doesn't go with the listing presentation. It doesn't go with the pre-listing package. And, you know, guys, we need to have that. A lot of agents are just swinging it. They're just shooting from their hip, right? They're just shooting from their hip. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. So this is why most agents are failing with it. And we're going to talk about what you could do with it, right? So number one, they never call enough to get really good. 
you know, it's like saying, hey, I want to be a really good golfer, but you never go play golf. Or you play once a month, you play twice a month. You never call them. Right? So if you're calling once a month, or if you're calling twice a month, you're never calling to be really good at making calls. That's it. You're never calling to make to be really good at making calls. That's all. Right? It takes practice, it takes repetition. You know? Number number two, they they don't use a script. And here's the thing, I'm gonna give you mine. Give me just a second here. And I'm gonna give you mine. You guys can screenshot it. And um Let's see, here you go. So this is my expired script. And guys, one thing you're gonna notice about all the scripts, all the coaching and all the training that, that I actually do with agents, is real simple, right? It's real simple. You know, hey, Mr. Seller, this is Jason Morris with um, XYZ Realty. Do you still wanna sell your home at 123 Main Street? Yes. Great, how much will you take for it, right? Just go ahead and go in and ask, that's it. How much will you take for it? Well, I saw you had on the market. Why do you think it didn't sell? Okay, legitimate, real question, right? So I've been doing some research. I believe I know why your old agent didn't sell it. How soon do you want to get rid of this place? Right? You're saying something that's going to pique your interest. I think I know why it didn't sell. Now, sometimes you're going to have to do, you're going to have to analyze it and you might have to actually see the house, right? But there's usually a reason it didn't sell. And lots of times the reason isn't just price, right? Usually it's features. But um, the next thing I like to do is I like to confirm some information that I see in MLS. Is this home, just like we talked about with the condo a little bit ago. You know, hey, it's a three-bedroom, three two-bath with a garage, right? Three-bedroom, two-bath without a garage. Is the roof new? Is it on half an acre? Whatever it is. Confirm the stuff you're seeing in MLS. And if you're using Red X, it's pulling it up right there, right there where you're making calls. So you got the MLS stuff right there. And then guys, what we need to do is set an appointment, right? And we need to set an appointment as quick as possible. I see agents doing this too. They'll talk to them on Monday and try to set an appointment for Friday. Now what happens between Monday and Friday is that other agents are calling them and they're getting involved in the conversation that you just had and possibly giving them information that is incorrect or information that is just not good, right? So as soon as we set an appointment, or guys, I do this even if I don't set an appointment. They say, oh, we're not wanting to meet agents right now. So, okay, no problem. Well, I'd like to send you some information about me and what we do to sell houses. Can I send you, I'd like, I can send you over my marketing package. And every one of us should have a pre-listing package. Do you have a pre-listing package? Give me a thumbs up or raise your hand if you got a pre-listing package that you can send right now, right? So guys, we go through the script. The script is easy right? We got to go through an easy script, an easy script. We can't do a script that's super complicated, right? And a lot of agents, one of the things they do is they use a script for like a little bit of time. Um, they use a script for a little bit of time. And um, then they take and they don't... Um, they basically switch. They switch up scripts, right? So they switch up scripts and then, um, then they basically, they basically just change, keep changing scripts. So the problem is, the problem is they never get really good. They never get to figure out what all the answers to those questions are. So here's the deal. If you ask the same question to a hundred sellers, if you ask it to a thousand sellers, one thing you're going to know that's going to happen is you're going to get really good at anticipating what their answer is. Sometimes you'll get so good after a little while, you can almost tell by their breathing pattern in the, in the phone, whether or not they're going to list the house with you. It's just, it just becomes muscle reflexes, but a lot of agents, they basically, they start using a script. They have a little bit of success with it. Instead of sticking with it, they go on a Facebook group like real estate agents that really work or something like that, and they see somebody that says, hey, set four appointments yesterday. They can say, oh, that's great, what script are you using? And they're going, oh, I'm using the great, great real estate agent, super, super coach script, and they say, hey, can you send me a copy? So that script that they just got good at, just started learning all the answers to the question, just started building some muscle memory, they switch scripts, 
So they switched the questions. Now they're getting new answers. And it's just not working for them like before. Right? So we got to use a script. Number three, they don't have a sales process. A lot of agents are out there. And if the person tells them yes on the phone, if the person sets an appointment with them, dude, they don't know what to do next. They don't know what is going to happen. They would actually, they're not scared of no's, they're scared of yeses. I see that a lot, you know? So guys, if you don't have a pre-listing package, if you don't have a pre-listing package, go get mine. I'll give it to you for free. It's at www.jasonmorrisprelistingpackage.com. So there it is, jasonmorrisprelistingpackage.com, right? That's it. So go there, download it. There's a video that walks you through the whole thing. Um, but I guarantee you, if you start trying to get that in as many sellers' hands as possible, you will definitely see a great, great increase in your business, right? So number four. This is something I see agents doing too. They keep talking about listing the house, right? They keep talking about listing the house. Guys, here's the problem with listing the house is a lot of these expired sellers, they don't want to list the house. They want to sell the house. House, You know, guys, so what we should do, we should make it easy. We should talk about what they want to talk about. You know, hey, the best conversations, the easiest conversations is when you have somebody there and you're talking about what they want to talk about, you know? Right? You're talking about what they want to talk about. They want to sell their house. Guys, here's another thing too. I see us happening. I'm guilty of this too. I would go in these listing appointments. This was when I was, when I was a new agent. I was really good at getting people on the phone. Like, I mean, really good at getting people on the phone and really good at setting appointments. And sometimes, man, I would just tell people whatever they wanted to hear to get my foot in the door. How many of you guys have done that? Tell them whatever they want to hear. Oh, we're previewing for a buyer. Oh, we might have a cash offer for you, right? Stuff that didn't even make sense. But <clears throat> I tell them whatever they wanted to hear to get my foot in the door. And then when I got my foot in the door, I'd basically never leave. <laughs> I'd basically stay until I guess I thought I was going to wear them down and they were going to sign the paperwork with me, get me to leave. But I'd stay at their house an hour, two hours, their eyes would be rolling back in their head. Um, you know, they would invite me to dinner. And here's the thing, I would leave going, man, those people love me. They invited me to dinner. Dude, the reason they invited me to dinner was because they were really nice people. And I'd stayed so damn long, they didn't think I was gonna leave. They were hungry, right? <laughs> they wouldn't invite me to dinner because they really wanted me to eat dinner with them. They just wanted to eat dinner themselves. Um, and they didn't think I was gonna go anywhere. Right, we're not going to listing appointments to make friends, I'm sorry. If you want to make friends, maybe you join a club or go to a bar or something. You know, there's a lot of a lot of places that are much, much easier to make friends at. Sure. Um, but a lot of agents go to listing appointments and they think they're there to make friends and that's not it. The only reason you're there, well, the only reason they have you there is because, hey, they want to sell their house. And technically you sell houses, right? And the only reason that you're really there is because Dude, it's your job. So that's it. That's it. The one thing I've learned, one thing I've learned is the shorter the listing appointment for me, the more likely I am going to get that listing. So number five, number five, a lot of agents, what they do is they make the calls. They'll make those initial calls and they'll call Kimmy Lewis, right? They'll call Kimmy Lewis and Kimmy's a super nice person. I know her personally. Um, she was one of the first people I met when I moved to Myrtle Beach, right? But they have a great conversation with a lady like Kimmy Lewis and Kimmy's super nice. And Kimmy tells them, Hey, yeah, I want to sell my house. And then guess what? They never follow up with them. They have a great call. Kimmy doesn't set an appointment right then. And they never follow up and talk to Kimmy. You know, guys, sometimes we're given objections. We're going to talk about objections real quick too. I know I don't have much time here left. Um, but you know, one of the things there, a lot of people are doing when we call them is, hey, dude, we're all busy. We all have kids. We all have jobs. We all have stuff to do. We all have hobbies. We all have busy lives. Even if you don't have a job right now, you still have a busy life. You know? Um, 
so we have these busy lives and when somebody calls us that appears to be a telemarketer, which that's what we appear to be when we're on the phone lots of times and we're calling somebody, we appear to be a telemarketer. And we're all guilty of this. They give us their go-to line, get us off the phone as quickly as possible. The same way we give go-to lines to people that call us, right? Because we, as real estate agents, we're constantly getting bombarded. Right now, I'm getting bombarded by this health insurance person that calls me. It was not a person, it's some company. And um, God, they call me all the time. But the thing is, um, and I don't want health insurance. We already have health insurance. I don't really, they might be a great deal. It might be better than what I've got. It might be cheaper than what I've got in the same service, right? But I don't care, man. They call me like the busiest time of the day. And, um, and we do that same thing. And sometimes, you know, they just can't meet with you today, right? But a lot of agents have these great calls and they just never follow up. You know, number six, number six, their posture on the phone sucks. Okay, posture is the belief in what you're doing regardless of external acceptance. Their phone posture and their tonality sucks. Right? And a lot of you guys are doing this and a lot of you guys are horrible on the phone, not because you don't know the script, but because you get on the phone, you get a little mousy, you get a little shy. You're a great outgoing person. You're really friendly. You have a great voice, but then when you get on the phone, you're like, Mr. Seller, Mr. Seller, I sell houses with you, please, list your house with you, right? And, um, and there's nothing exciting about that. There's nothing fun. There's nothing that gets their attention. Um, posture can be heard. I agree. I agree. I think your confidence level shows through. And I think there's only one way to develop posture and the confidence on the phone. Well, number, well there's two ways. Number one, you got to be self-aware. Like all you guys are listening to me right now and you know, you're doing it right. Now. You know, your tonality on the phone sucks. You sound like you're tired. You sound like you're, you sound like you just woke up. You don't sound excited. You don't sound confident. You're going, yeah, Mr. Seller, we can sell a house. Please let me list your house with you, with me. Please let me come list your house, Mr. Seller. Sucks. Who wants to list their house with that person? Right. It's like if you went to the doctor, let's say you go to the doctor and they go, um, and you go to, you got two doctors, right? You're getting a second opinion. You got to have surgery. First doctor goes, well, you know, we might can do this surgery. We're just going to get in there and look around and just hope for the best. Right. They can't tell you about recovery time. They can't tell you about their plan. Might last 20 minutes, might last two hours. Who knows? Right. But they don't sound real comfortable about the surgery. You go to doctor number two and doctor number two goes, hey, here's steps one, two, and three, two week recovery. You're going to be brand new. This is how long you're going to have pain. This is how long the surgery lasts. This is how long you're going to be under, right? I mean, they're like, bam, bam, bam. Hey, no problem, Jason. We do three of these a day. You know, do you want to be number one or you want to be number three that day? You know, I kind of want to be number two, right? After you've had a warm up, but not when you're tired. Um, but it's the same way. It's like when you go, to, if you went and talked to an attorney, like you had a major legal problem, right? You go talk to an attorney, you talk to number one, and he's basically like, yeah, we might can get you out of this. You won't go to jail, maybe. You talk to number two, and he goes, yeah, I know the solicitor's office. Yeah, we've dealt with this before. Yeah, you've got great evidence. Yeah, this is what our plan's going to be. Right? Which one are you going to go to? You're going to go to the plan, right? I believe, I tell you this, I believe that sellers are picking us, some, not based on the company we're with, sometimes because of the confidence level they can hear that we have about ourselves, number one, and number two, the plan that we're telling them and the confidence we have in that plan. I believe that. I could be wrong, but I believe that. And I feel like I see it. I feel like I see it over and over again. So guys, it's like that time when you're super busy, it's like everybody wants to work with you. When you're super busy, you got five contracts going on, going on, your phone is blowing up. You got people messaging you through Facebook you went to high school with. Everybody wants to do business with you, right? Versus that time where, you know, dude, you're struggling to get a deal together and man, <laughs> You just can't get them closed. You can't get the people to sign the contract, right? It's hard when you when you have zero deals going on. It's hard to get one. 
when you got 10 deals going on, man, 11 and 12 are so easy. Number 11 and number 12 fall in your lap. You know, I think it's confidence level. I think that's it. I think it's your posture and your confidence level. So number seven, I think a lot of agents out there making calls are never offering any value. The calls are 100% self-serving. They're never calling the seller and telling them anything. And you know, their follow-up sucks. Their follow-up's like, like, hey, Kimmy, Jason Morris here. Hey, Kimmy, Jason Morris here. Hey, you want to list your house today? Well, no, I don't. Versus, hey, Kimmy, this is Jason Morris. Hey, I want to give you a call. I was doing some research for a buyer. Doing a research for a buyer, pulled up some stuff in your community. I just want to let you know, one just came on the market yesterday in your community for $150,000. I know you wanted $149,900 for yours. Um, this house looks like it's going to probably sell quick. I feel like yours is a better deal than that, or you got a better lot, or you've got hardwood floors and this one doesn't, right? You know, what's that unique selling thing they told you about there on a corner lot, or a lot that backs up to the pond? They're all, hey guys, is there a lot that backs up to the woods? That's, that's a big deal sometimes, right? And we have to talk about those. I, you know, guys, I don't understand why a lot of agents, they look at strictly, they look at the comps, but they don't really look at the features of it. They just go, hey, that last house sold for 159.9. So this one should sell for 159 now, right? Forget that there's nothing on the market now and forget that last house backed up to another house and this house backs up to a beautiful pond or this house backs up to the woods, right? I see a lot of agents doing that. You know, hey, Mr. Seller. Yeah, this is a great line. Hey, Mr. Seller. Hey, Jason Morris here. I just want to give you a quick call. I had two houses come on the market in the last week in your neighborhood. However, um, you told me on the phone that you, uh, put new granite countertops in and you got a new roof and new HVAC. These other houses don't have that. Now I know for some of you guys, that don't sound like a big deal as long as the roof's in good shape and the HVAC is good. But let's say, you know, we're comparing apples to apples. we got the same two houses sitting there. Let's just say they're on the same street. They got the same landscaping, right? Built the same year, but they're both 15 years old. They're in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. One has a brand new roof and a brand new HVAC. The other one doesn't. Which house would you pick? Even if there was $5,000 apart, the one with the new roof was five grand more, which house would you make an offer on first? I mean, me being the agent I am, I'd encourage the one with the new roof, right? Even if we offered the same price as the one down the street, because I know that we have a lot of salt in our area and we have hurricanes and tropical storms every year. And I know that, you know, Hey, a 30 year roof don't really last 30 years in Myrtle Beach. I know that air conditioner, you know, only has a lifespan of a certain amount of years and 15 years, you're kind of getting up there, especially with the salt in the air, right? We need to make sure we're offering that value. And some of you guys, some of you guys are turning down listings right now. We're in a super hot market. Some of you guys have people where you're pulling comps and you're going, oh, it should be priced at 150. You're going, hey, I adjusted my microphone. Sorry about that, Andrea. Um, but you're going, hey, it should be priced at 150 when um, when there's nothing on the market. They have a couple of extra features, and they won't, they're going to need 159.9 to net what they want to net. You're passing up those listings, and they got motivation. You should list air. You should take every listing that you can take as long as it's within a price range that's reasonable, right? You should take them all. You should take them all. So, guys. First two steps, I wanna tell you this, you guys that are starting out, you're starting out making calls, whether you're calling for sale owners, whether you're circle prospecting, whether you're doing expireds, these things will work for you, I promise. First two steps to get really good at prospecting, number one is to prospect more, make more calls, right? If you make more calls, you're gonna get good at it. If you make more calls, it's just a numbers game, right? Yeah, sometimes I do pause for thought, but Sometimes I pause just to make sure everybody got, got what I said because sometimes I feel like I talk fast. But we really need to um, we really need to prospect more. That's number one. You're just even if you even if you're really bad on the phone, if you make more calls, you're going to get more deals. That's just the way it is. You talk to more sellers, you're going to work with more sellers. If you want to do more real estate business, guys, there's two people we work with. We work with buyers and we work with sellers. If you want to do more business in the real estate business, we need to talk to the two clients that we can work with. We need to talk to more sellers. We need to talk to more buyers. That's it. 
It's pretty simple, right? And number two, use a script, consistently use a script, right? Now, number three, I think that we need to all do this. We need to be better at this sort of thing because most of us are really bad at it. Most of us are spending our days in reaction mode and being in reaction mode is where you basically get up and you have no idea. You have no idea what's going on that day. You have no, you have no idea what's going on that day. You're just going to get up and just hope. You're just going to get up and you're just going to hope that something happens, right? You're going to hope something happens and you're going to hope things work out and you're going to hope your phone rings and guys reaction mode sucks. Back when I had a big team and I had owned a property management company, I was in reaction mode seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And I was always, you know, sometimes I'd be sitting there and it was really quiet and I would literally be like, like feel like I was white knuckling, gripping my hands because I knew the phone was going to ring any minute and it was going to be something really bad. But here's the thing. There's no emergencies in the real estate business. Did you guys know that? That addendum that they're calling you about right now, that addendum they called you about right now, guys, look here, it can wait. It can wait an hour. It can wait two hours, right? Even if you send it over right now, the underwriter isn't going to look at it right now. I mean, yeah, sorry, but it's, it's like that. The underwriter isn't going to look at it right now. So guys, if we made a schedule, I guarantee you guys, if you guys made a schedule and stuck to it, 75% of the time, right? Just scheduled your mornings. I believe if you can control your morning, you can really get a good handle on your business, controlling your business, controlling your income, controlling everything. If you get a really good handle on your morning till like 11 a.m. Okay, and so we gotta, to do that, we gotta make a schedule. We gotta know what we're gonna do tomorrow. Because if we leave it up to fate, fate is not our friend. So but number one, we gotta schedule family time. Right, whatever you got going on. If you're taking your kids to school, if you got softball games, if you got soccer, if you got ballet, whatever it is, right? And you're the person responsible for doing that, then you need to make sure that's in your schedule. Okay? If you've got date night, if you've got trips, if you got whatever it is, we got to put those in our schedule first because typically if your business life and your family life collide, only one of those things are going to survive. I think that's why most of the real we have such a high divorce rate in the real estate industry. Now, number two, we need to put non-negotiable business things in there. Now, this is things like continuing education, right? Uh, things that aren't going to change. If you're networking at chamber events, okay, they're not going to move the chamber event because a buyer called you to look at your house at six o'clock, right? You know, coaching calls, office meetings, right? You're not going to change the office meeting because you had a client call you, right? So we got to put those things in our schedule. But number three, number three is um, most, uh, most uh, important one to keep your business going is prospecting. It's the most important thing to keep your business going. Okay. If you don't keep adding to the top of the funnel, the bottom of the funnel is eventually going to go dry. Okay. And this is why I believe this is why a lot of agents will see them. They'll get three or four deals under contract. They work really hard. They close those three or four deals. And then for two, you know, two, three months, they have nothing going on. It's because their funnel went dry. You know, whatever they were doing to get business, they quit doing. So what ended up happening, what ends up happening is when you quit calling, when you start making calls, it takes a little bit for the pipeline to fill up. It does. And I go lie. You know, some, sometimes you get lucky and you get one the first day, but sometimes you don't. But it takes a little bit for your pipeline to fill up, okay? Then um, once it gets full, you got to keep prospecting and dumping some people in it because if you don't, then what's going to happen is going to it's going to run out at the end, right? And number four, number four is everything else. That's the, that's the stuff like, hey, if you're working on a website, if you're working on a blog, whatever it is, and um. Guys, if you want, if somebody would take a screenshot of this, post it in Real Estate Agents to Really Work and tell them you got it from this webinar just because I feel like this is an easy way to make a schedule that a lot of other agents need to see. If you guys could do that for me, I'd really appreciate it. If somebody could do that for me, um, screenshot it, post it in Real Estate Agents to Really Work and um, 
say that you got it from this webinar tonight. So, so I'm going to show you guys. See what my next slide is. So I'm going to show you guys a graphic that talks about exactly what what we're doing just now. Because I feel like you guys need to um, need to see this. So give me just a second, just a second. Okay, guys, this is a great graphic too. Love for you guys to screenshot this one and add it to real estate agents to really work as well. So guys, this is what your business needs to look at, look like, right? And it isn't just with expired leads, it's with everything. It doesn't matter if you're doing Facebook ads, it doesn't matter if you're doing Zillow or whatever it is. We got to keep dumping, we got to keep dumping leads into the top. And I just got asked to share the Red X URL again. That URL is jasonmorrisredx.com. Okay, so um, that's the that's the link where you can just log on. You can subscribe to Expires and you can get a discount today at a way to set up costs. So guys, we got to keep dumping leads into the top of the funnel, right? Those first conversations, those first conversations wean through. That is getting, um, I think that's your internet connection. That might be making it a little bit blurry, but that is your, those first calls, that's you weeding through the data. That's you getting the numbers that are correct, right? Remember, we talked about this. This is mine data. So this data is not going to be 100% correct. So we got to go through it. We got to mine through it. We got to look for the good numbers, right? We got to look for the good numbers. We got to look for the people that are interested in selling their house. And then really, level two is following up with the correct numbers. That's looking for the second call. That's looking for the third call, the people that really want to do something. Number three is long-term follow-up. Remember, I talked about Daryl Self, and I did an interview with him. He talked about taking a $400,000 um, listing in this interview. He talked about it taking him 25 follow-up calls. Guys, I followed up with people until, honestly, it was almost embarrassing. You know, hey, this is Jason again. Um, but, guys, you know what? We have to follow up from the perspective of a helpful part. We're following up because, honestly, the reason I followed up was because I felt like I was the best person to sell their house. And I'll tell you guys this, like back years ago when we were doing a lot of short sales, um, I didn't do short sales. I did a lot of short sales, but I didn't do short sales because I like doing short sales. I done short sales because I'd spent a lot of time like researching the process and researching programs and stuff. And I felt like I was the best person to help those people get from out from under their home. Right. Yes, Andrea, if you could um, if you could screenshot this for me and post it in real estate agents that really work. And um, I think this is a graphic everybody needs to see or they need to see some version of this graphic. I feel like this is something that every real estate office needs to be teaching. The brand new agents need to see this because, guys, you got the first level figuring out if they want to do something or not, figuring out if they gave you the right number, if they're qualified, whatever it is. Second level is following up with the correct numbers. Level three is long-term follow-up. That's the people that want to do something. Okay, level four is going on your appointments. That's the listing appointments, buyer's appointments, whatever you got. Number five is getting paperwork signed. Right? That's when you're, you actually got a deal going on. Okay, I feel like if we can understand our business and look at our business this way, it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? And you know, the top of that funnel is really, really wide because we got to dump a lot of leads in. We got to dial a lot of numbers. And you know what, guys? We're in this crazy business here where we don't have to bat 300, right? If you, if you were in playing baseball and you, if you batted 400 for just one season, you'd be a Hall of Fame player and you'd make millions and millions of dollars, okay? Now, fortunately for us, you know, we're in a business where you can make millions of dollars. Let's be honest. You can make millions of dollars in the real estate business. It's very doable. I've met a lot of agents that are making millions of dollars, right? Um, we're in a business where you can do that. Okay, but the good thing for us is, you know what? We don't have to bat 300. We don't have to get 10 out of 10. You know, guys, we can take a listing a week. 
we can have a lot of at bats, a lot of great conversations, and take a, end up taking a listing a week, a couple listings a month in a lot of your markets, and do extremely well financially. We are literally in a business that you know gives you the ability to do whatever you want to do. Really, I mean, there's nothing else quite like this. So, um, but if we can look at our business in this way, it just makes it easier. Just makes it easier. So, guys, I told you guys that I would go through a couple of objections. Do you guys want me to keep going? I know we promised an hour. We're going a little bit over. I got some objections we can go over too that I like to go over. Yes. Put in the comments, yes, keep going, or wrap it up, Jason. All right? Put in the comments for me. And if you want, we'll talk about some objections and stuff. Keep going. Keep going. I got a couple of keep goings. Cool. Cool, man. Well, I tell you what, we're going to keep going. Keep going. Cool. So, um, so, guys, let's talk about, give me just a second here. Let me find my page. Sometimes I get lost in my own stuff, man. Um, so I wrote this book. I wrote this book a while back. Um, got published. It's on Amazon. Um, I'm going to show you guys this if I can figure out how to do it. Okay, share screen. How to be an objection master. I don't know if you guys got any of these books. How to be an objection master. But this was a, this was a good one. I feel like this was one of my best ones. You know, I did how to be a FISMO master. I sold like at this point, I think I've sold and given away like 20,000 copies. I did How to Be an Expired Master, which was really good. And then I did, I did this follow-up Master Day Planner, which is available on Amazon too. But then I did this Objection Master thing, and I don't think there was anything like this that came out. Because one thing I can tell you guys is, um, you know, with the time I've been in the real estate business, I've heard all the objections. And here's the crazy thing. The same objections I was getting 16, 17 years ago when I first got on the phone are the same objections that sellers are given now. They're the same objections you guys tell me about all the time, right? There's no new objections, right? There's only a couple of ways to handle objections. Okay, now an objection, I'm going to give you guys a definition here, which I think, I think this is great. Now, Oxford Dictionary describes an objection as an expression or feeling of disapproval or opposition, a reason for disagreeing. Sometimes, guys, I don't know about you, but sometimes we disagree for the sake of just disagreeing. When you, I mean, what do you think about that? Sometimes we disagree because we don't have time to listen to their story, right? Sometimes we disagree just because, hey, just sitting a good time, we don't have time for it. We're busy, right? Now, I got a little bit different belief and I put it here. You guys are welcome to screenshot this too. I don't know how well you can see it, but, um, but I'll read it to you. What I believe an objection is, I believe an objection is often just an excuse not to do something. In the case of this book, it's a real estate property sell seller telling you their go-to line that is often just something to get you off the phone. The sales objection is a direct response in the evolution to our ancestors' physiological reaction of fight or flight that occurs in the presence of something terrifying, either mentally or physically. In modern society, we're not experiencing this reaction due to Attacking wild animals, it's a response to the common sales call. It's a smoke screen. There's nothing more. It's a smoke screen. For most agents, it's a minor tactic that defeats them and somehow gets them to give up on their goals. Mo most agents are going to create more objections on the phone than they will ever overcome because they refuse to learn scripts, stick to them, and practice. Okay, now I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball to you guys here. And um, now sometimes the objections we think we are getting are not objections, right? They're not objections. They're conditions, okay? They're not objections, they're conditions. And what a condition is, it's, and it's easy to get these things confused, right? A condition is something that, is real. It's the state of something with regards to its appearance, quality, or working order. The wiring is in good condition, right? The weather is good condition. The weather is a condition, right? So I want to tell you guys the story real quick. I had this guy, ended up selling his house, but we were planning to put his house on the market. 
we had Hurricane Matthew coming. Hurricane Matthew was four years ago. And um, Hurricane Matthew was kind of bad in our area. Well, we were going to put his house on the market, and that was like a Wednesday or Thursday. Well, hurricane came, a tree fell, and it fell over on his house. Okay. I talked to him like that Friday when I was supposed to go over there. I called him that morning. I said, hey, man, you know, I um, just want to call you and see how things are going. You know, I know we had a hurricane. We'll see if you guys, you know, just checking in with him. Hey, you know, we still on for our appointment at 2 o'clock. Well, he tells me, he said, he said, hey, Jason, you know, um, here's my problem, man. I got a tree that fell in the house. It didn't really damage the house, but, it, you know, I got to replace some shingles. I got a few things I got to do, and I got to get this tree cut off the house. It's probably going to be a week or two. Okay, now, a lot of agents, I'll tell you what a lot of agents would have done. A lot of agents would have said, oh, damn, they don't want me to come there. And they would have taken that highly personal, right? They would, have, they would have said, oh, well, they don't want to list with me, and they never followed up with this guy. Well, guys, guess what? The guy really had a tree fall in his house. And if we could have listed that house, guys, we could have listed that house. But for me to take pictures, I'd have taken a picture of the house with a tree on it, right? It didn't make a lot of sense for me to go list the house. It actually would have done him more harm than anything else because he's got a tree laid over on the front of the house. So we see things like that. I mean, it would have done any more harm. Now, we waited two weeks. I kept following up with him, asking him, hey, can I help you? Do you need somebody to help you um, get it off? Do you have a roofer, right? Now, if we'd have listed that thing with the tree picture on there, man, I would have got calls. The number one thing would have been, oh, the roof's bad. Tree fell on it. Roof wasn't bad, man. Tree just kind of laid over on it. Just need some shingles replaced and the tree cut off. That's it. So sometimes, guys, you know, and actually, you know what, I use that, that example of that. That was a great example, I believe. Um, but um, sometimes, guys, we get a condition. They say, hey, we can't meet you at 2 o'clock. Well, they can't meet you at 2 o'clock because guess what? They go to work. Guess what? They got a doctor's appointment. Guess what? They got stuff going on. They got to pick up the kids at 3, right? But we never ask the next question. We never ask the next question, so we never know. Oh, you can't meet. Oh, what's going on at three? Hey, well, I can't meet you at two o'clock. Hey, no problem. We'll a little later in the day work for you. When we're going through this set appointments, we got to make sure that we're we're dictating the time to begin with, right? When you call your dentist and you schedule an appointment, the dentist just don't say, "Hey, Ed, come on, come on in whenever you feel like it." Do they? They say, "No, we got an appointment at two o'clock. Can you be here at two? That's what they do. And that's what we have to do too. We have to dictate our schedule. Dictating your schedule does a couple of things for you. One thing, it puts you in power, puts you in control of the schedule. And number two, it helps overcome objections because, um, you know, lots of times agents go, oh, well, what time works for you? And the, the guy on the phone says, oh, I don't know. I got to ask my wife. And they, the agent goes, oh, well, ask your wife and call me back. Well, dude, you created an objection you can't overcome. Right, where you could have, same situation, same situation. You could have said, hey, man, well, I'll tell you what, would Saturday at 11 o'clock work for you? Well, I don't really know. I have to check with her. Hey, no problem. I'll tell you what, well, I'm going to be in that area anyway, so I'm going to pencil you in at 11 o'clock. And if that doesn't work for her, this is my cell number. Give me a call or text me on it, and we can schedule for a better time. Is that okay with you? Oh, yeah, that's good with me. No problem, man. If they, if they push back a little bit, say, hey, no problem, call the wife. Or how about I give you a call a little later today when she's home? All right, let me send you over my pre-listing package. All right, a lot of agents don't realize that. Now, now, there's two basic strategies to overcoming any objection, and you guys can go out and use these tomorrow. Okay, so two basic strategies. Number one, overcome the objection quickly and revert back to your original script. Number two, get as much information as possible and follow up. Now, a condition, the only thing that can really overcome a condition is time. That's it. Nothing else we can do. But if we overcome the objection very quickly, revert back to our original script, we're good to go. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, if we get as much information as possible and then we follow up in a day, we follow up in two days, guess what? They probably forgot when they talked to us, honestly. Guys, that mean seller, the seller was really mean to you yesterday. Oh, yeah, agents were crappy and they didn't like them and how you're the devil and 
they hope you all die, right? That person that was super mean to you, call them in two days. They won't even remember that call. They don't even know. They don't know. They don't know about it. They'll remember they talked to a real estate agent, maybe, but they don't remember. They won't remember that it's, it's Steve Slay. They don't remember that it's Laura Parker. They won't remember who it is, right? So, guys, I got a couple. I'm going to go over the what I think is the top, like, three objections, okay? And then we're going to wrap it up. And any questions you have, I'm happy to answer them. And um, so we're not ready to list our house. So now this is often no more than a smokescreen, right? So this is why we got to focus on selling their house. Because that's what they want after all. You know, you guys that have listened to Zig Ziglar, you know, you know that people don't buy drill bits, they buy holes, right? I've never bought a drill bit just because I was like, hey, let's go get a drill bit. It's fun. They're on sale. No, I bought a drill bit because I needed a hole drilled in something, right? I don't buy gas just because I like to go to the gas station. I like the way it smells when I pump it, right? I don't buy gas for that reason. I buy gas because I need it to drive my car. I don't really need gas. I just need to get from point A to point B. And I mean, really, any type of thing, electric car would suffice for that. Gas isn't really that important. Getting from point A to point B is, right? So when they say, hey, we're ready, not ready. We're not ready to list our house. Agent, no problem. You do want to sell your house though, right? I'll blow this up so you guys can screenshot it. Maybe I'll blow it up. Let's see. Let's see here. There we go. There we go. We're not ready to list our house. No problem. You do want to sell your house, correct? Yeah, we want to sell our house. Go back to your original script. Easy, right? Not rocket science for sure. Guys, listen to this one. How many of you guys have gotten this one? We don't want to pay a real estate commission. Have you ever got this? Have you ever got this objection? We don't want to pay a real estate commission, right? Raise your hand if you got this before. Hey, I don't want to pay a real estate commission. Hey, guess what? Just like I said a minute ago, I don't want to put gas in my car, but I don't want to walk. Okay? Here's how we handle it. Seller, we're not ready to list our house. We don't want to pay a real estate commission. Hey, no problem. You do want to sell your house, though, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah, we want to sell their house. Great. Go back to the original question. You know what? I had to have the brakes fixed on my truck the other day. You know what? I didn't really want to pay to have the brakes fixed, but you know what I like doing? I like stopping. I like stopping at stop signs and stop lights. I mean, that's it. Sometimes if you want to sell your house, you have to hire a professional to do it. You know, I don't want cavities, but... We're not going to Home Depot trying to fill our own cavities, right? You know, so let's see. Next one here. Guys, so this is my favorite one. This is my favorite one here. We'll pay you 3% if you bring a buyer. How many of you guys have got this one? We'll pay you 3% if you bring a buyer. Okay, so now this is my favorite objection to get. And there's a lot of you guys listen to this and a lot of you guys are going to be listening to the recording. And they're going, Oh, well, they don't want to pay this. I, I charge more than 3%. I charge whatever you charge, right? Where this isn't a commission discussion. This is just an example of objections, right? <clears throat> we'll pay 3% if you bring a buyer. Well, number one, number one, they're offering to pay you, <laughs> right? It, maybe it isn't what you charge, but they see value in the need for your service. Okay. That's number one. Number two, they're open to the possibility of working with you. And number three, they're super easy to set an appointment with, right? Because they're basically telling you, hey, look, we'll pay you, Jason. Um, so when you get this objection, everybody should get super excited. When you're going down their Craigslist looking for, for sale by owners and you see this, um, I would not never try to negotiate the commission on the phone. Set an appointment quickly as possible. You actually, I tell you what, use your net sheet. We talk about this in my group coaching. Use your net sheet to negotiate commission. Because you know what? Nobody really cares that much what they're paying lots of times. Most sellers, every now and then you get that seller that's, you know, a jerk and they want to nickel and dime everything. But most people are just looking at what they're going to walk away with. And you know what? Believe it or not, believe it or not, most of our clients have never worked with a real estate agent. So guess what? Guess what? They don't know how real estate agents really work. And you would not believe how many times I've talked to sellers and 
they were hardcore. No, they didn't want to hire me. And when we really got down to things and after a conversation, I realized they thought they were going to have to pay me my commission up front, but they thought they were going to have to pay me if the house did sell. Guys, we're paid for performance, right? We only get paid if we sell a house. Now, some of you guys are doing some funky stuff, trying to take some money up front, doing stuff like that, but I don't like that. I'm just being honest with you. I don't like that. Because you know what? I can take a lot more listings when I'm getting paid for performance, right? If we don't sell your house, you don't pay me money. So here's the thing. We'll pay you 3% if you bring a buyer. Fantastic. Will you be home at 4 o'clock today? Yes. Go through the rest of your script. Send them your pre-listing package. Great. I'm going to stop by and take a look at your house so we can see if we have a buyer for you. What's your email address? I want to send you some information on me and my team and we'll see them so you know who's coming. Then you send your pre-listing package. That's it. That's it. We'll go down through one or two more. I got a couple more here. I want to go down through. Or I think I want to go down through. We want to do some updates before we put our house on the market. I don't know about you guys, but this right here is another one that is like my favorite one. Because I can tell you this, guys. If there's anybody that knows about like stuff, like how much stuff costs in Home Depot and Lowe's and how much stuff costs to do in your house, it's me. This is like my area, right? Is doing something to a house, right? I usually got a pretty good idea. I can look at it for about three seconds and guy, I got a good idea. I just got a lot of experience, right? And for even the ones of you guys that don't have that experience, you know what? If you're previewing houses and you're really researching your market, you probably know. Guys, I'm gonna tell you what, I got a listing that I'm actually, I'm actually, um, I'm sitting over paperwork for tonight and guess what? The previous agent gave them a list of stuff they need to fix in the house. This thing is ridiculous. Ridiculous. They just said, well, we'd like to list it, but we don't want to list it until you do these things. Dude, these things aren't even important. I mean, and they're motivated sellers too. I mean, they're motivated sellers. The list of stuff is like a baseboard is loose. Who is checking baseboards? Why was this agent checking their baseboard? I have so many questions actually. Um, that agent does not sell any houses, I guarantee you. They sell like one house a year, right? But I love this objection because you know what? If they'll call me and they'll let me go over their house, I've seen sellers, they spend a lot of unnecessary money. They over-improve the house. You know, they're in a $150,000 neighborhood and they think they need real hardwood floors and granite countertops. Where every house that has ever sold in the history of that neighborhood has Fomica countertops and they have carpet, right? And um, you know what? I just talked to another seller the other day and um, some really nice people, some people that we know, and they have got it. They actually have their house listed. They should have listed it with me to begin with. And they could have saved so much headaches and stuff, but their house is going to expire in a week or two. And um, they're kind of getting things straight. This agent has told them about improvements they think they need to make. One of the improvements is granite countertops and they got a giant kitchen and, um, and it's probably ten, twelve thousand dollars worth of, ten twelve thousand dollars worth of improvement and um and uh anyway i mean it's um yeah it's extensive and this agent's telling them hey hey you got to do this to sell your house you got to do that to sell your house and um you know we're honestly man i mean i don't know i didn't ask him but i don't know if these people have 15 grand to put in the house this guy would be a lot better off. He'd, he'd do a better service for them and their situation if he price reduced them $5,000, you know? And honestly, if he just took better pictures, made a better description, and like actually mentioned the bonus room. I mean, you know, but if they call me, here's the script. Hey, we want to do some updates before we put our house on the market. Hey, fantastic. I tell you what, how about if I come over, take a look? I have a lot of clients do work before putting their home on the market. I might can help you make some choices that will save you some money and help help make sure that you get a return on the money you're investing in these upgrades. Now, sometimes you go over and you're like, man, yeah, yeah, you should have done that a long time ago, you know? But um, yeah, Bob, you know what? I just heard of Curbio, um, but I'll be honest with you, I'm a little 50-50 on that service. Number one, it's so new. And for you guys that haven't heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but Curbio is a, um, is a program where you basically pay for um you pay for repairs and pay for upgrades but basically you pay for them after at the closing and it's kind of a funky sort of a thing 
but anyway, um, I, yeah, I'm not sure about it. You know, I don't know anybody that's actually used it, which doesn't mean anything. But for me, I'm a little skeptical of it at first. You know, I've just got a lot of experience dealing with contractors and, um, and I feel like it might not be the best option, but I might be wrong. Right. I mean, it's like Uber, nobody, you know, whoever thought we'd be, um, we'd be purposely getting in the cars with strangers, you know, uh, unmarked cars with strangers, mostly, you know, whoever thought we'd do that. Um, but I'm not saying it's bad. It's just new. Um, yeah. I don't know anybody that's used to me either. It's wild. So here's another great one. And we're going to go over this one and we're going to wrap it up. And if you guys have any questions, post them. I'm happy to answer any question you have. So we already have an agent. So guys, this is a common objection. I feel like if it isn't on MLS and they're attempting to do for sale by owner, they more than likely don't have paperwork signed and they probably don't have an agent, right? We already got an agent we're talking to. Oh, great. So, um, so give me just a second here. You know, I had somebody complain that sometimes I drink water during webinars. It's been an hour and a half. Sorry, guys. I had to drink some water. So um, how do we handle this objection? So, hey, we already have an agent. Fantastic. Who's your agent? Let them answer. They might not even have an agent. Dude, you know, so many times I've had people to tell me agents' names. And sometimes, hey, I had one one time tell me an agent's name. They say, yeah, we got an agent we're going to use. They're so-and-so. Dude, that agent died. I mean, you know, sometimes we're sub owners, right? This is just another smoke screen. It's just an objection. But yeah, I had them tell me about an agent one time. They said, yeah, we're going to use so-and-so. And I mean, I kind of knew the guy. Dude, the guy died. I mean, they hadn't talked to him. I mean, I mean, unless they had, you know, Ouija board or something. But, you know, and sometimes they talk about agents. That agent isn't in the business still. You know, one, a client that I have is one, probably, probably one of my favorite clients. He's a friend of mine. I talk to him often. I've sold like seven or eight houses for him and he's always got something going on. He calls me and tells me about, and, um, dude, the first time I talked to him, I remember he told me that he said, yeah, I got an agent. Tells me his agent's name. I knew the guy. I said, no kidding. I said, no kidding. I know him. Um, good deal. Uh, why hasn't he put it on the market for you yet? And out of nowhere, he goes, oh, well, he's hog hunting all week. He's hog hunting all week, and he can't get it, he can't get it on MLS. I said, well, has he got paperwork signed with you? He said, no, I hadn't signed nothing with him either. He's supposed to send that over to me, but he told me he's going to be hog hunting all week. I said, no kidding. I said, well, I'm going to tell you what, I don't hog hunt, and I can come over and get on MLS today. And the guy goes, really? And I said, yeah. I mean, you know, I met him like two hours later, listed this house. It's only a $50,000 house, but you know what? I've sold seven or eight for him. I mean, I've done close to a million dollars worth of business with this guy. And I'll tell you what, looks are deceiving. This guy, you would not think he had a million dollars worth of real estate. And get this, none of it had loans. None of it's had loans on it. There have been super easy transactions. The guy's, the guy's a retired contractor. He will do anything just about to sell a house. Everyone he puts on the market looks great. And if they say, hey, I want this to make the deal work, dude, he goes and does it. And this agent lost that client because he just wouldn't, he wouldn't seem sending the paperwork. But anyway, so who's your agent? Let them answer. They say, oh, my agent's, you know, John Smith, he works for whatever company. I'll tell you what, how about if I send you over a marketing plan? You can look it over and compare it to theirs. There might be a few things you can steal from it. Ha <laughs> ha. Might be even be a few things you can steal for it, but this plan sold however many homes your office sold last year, right? Put it on there. If you had a big office, it's going to be an impressive number. If you're at a small office, you know, maybe you don't want to talk about it that much. But yeah, this plan sold 400 houses last year. What's your email address? They're going to take your plan. Okay, and then what you got to do is you got to follow up, right? You got to follow up. And so this is it. You always want to follow up. You always want to follow up, but hey, I tell you what, how about if I send you over a marketing plan? You can uh, look it over and compare it to theirs. There might be a few things you can steal from it. This plan sold 400 homes in the last year. What's your email? Because guys, you know, lots of times we think we're all there by ourselves, but really we have an office that we're a part of. 
And guys, use that office as numbers, especially if you're a new agent, even experienced agent, use that office as numbers, because guess what? Those numbers, yeah, Nate, if you're in an office with 50 agents, your numbers are gonna be a lot bigger than yours by yourself. If you're in an office with two or 300 agents, guess what? Numbers are even gonna be bigger, right? Use those numbers, use that to your advantage. If you're at a franchise, if you're at, if you're at say Keller Williams, right? Mention it, you know, we got 150,000 agents across the country. Right, it's a big number. Mention it with the biggest franchise in the country. You know, if you're at Remax, hey, use whatever their advantage is. When I was at Better Homes and Gardens, I used to talk about the magazine was on one was on one in five coffee tables in North America. Yeah, yeah, we're we're affiliated with the magazine. It's on one one in five coffee tables in North America. The website gets over eight million visitors a month. I think it was eight million visitors a month. Right now, their their single wide mobile home probably ain't gonna be on the website or the magazine, but you know, it's impressive, right? It's impressive that the website's in there. That's the sort of marketing you have behind, right? And it was a brand that people trust. You know, I do believe that if you have advantages like that, you should use them, right? Let's go, let's start at the script at the beginning. So we already have an agent, fantastic, who's your agent? Oh, my agent's John Smith with whatever XYZ Realty. I'll tell you what, how about if I send you over our marketing plan? You can look it over and compare it to theirs. Might be a few things you can steal from it. Ha ha ha, this plan sold 400 homes last year. What's your email address? They go, oh, great, great. Send it to them, follow it the next day. So follow up with them and say, hey, Mr. Sellers, Jason Morris, I just want to make sure you got everything from me. And I was kind of wondering, how does our marketing plan compare to theirs? Chances are they had no marketing plan. So they have no marketing plan. So what are they going to do? Stick a sign in your yard and hope something happens? I used to work for this old guy. He used to have a lot of a lot of weird sayings and funny sayings and stuff. And I guess it was because he was like 70 and had been in the real estate business for like 50 years. But he used to call this poking and praying. He said, you poke a sign in the front yard and you pray it's going to sell. And, um, you know, every now and then I, I'll tell that story when I got some I said, yeah, I used to work for this old guy. He used to call, what are, so what are they going to do? Just um, poke and pray? I used to work for this old broker. He called it that. So they poke a sign in your front yard. Poke a sign on the ground in your front yard and pray that something happens. And um, I mean, that's what some agents are doing out there, right? If they don't have a marketing plan, if they don't have a written plan to sell your home, what else are they doing? But guys, that's an easy objection. Easy objection. Calls back after the holidays. You know, guys, this is a great one there. It's a great one. Or your home was listed before. How many of you guys have ever got that objection? How many of you have ever got that one? Call me. Uh, where were you when our home was listed before? Hey, that hey, Mr. Seller, that's a great question. I look on MLS daily at all the homes in the market. Plus, I talked to a lot of agents. Your previous agent didn't let me know about your home. Sorry. I mean, I'm looking at it right now online. Do you still want to sell it? I can tell you exactly why it didn't sell. Let them answer. Right? Be aggressive when you're talking to them. Be aggressively assertive. And hey, look at this one. Look at this one, guys. How about this one? You're the 30th agent that called me today. I mean, typically these people aren't getting any phone calls, right? But when you go from two calls a day that are telemarketers to 10, you know, it feels like a lot of calls. You know, we really need to focus on selling their house, right? Seller, you're the 30th agent that called me today. Wow, that's a lot. You really had 30 agents call? Yeah. Were they all asking you to list their house? And guess what, guys? I've got a lot of them this way. Were they, were they asking you to list their house? Like, oh, yeah, they were. They just want the listing. Blah, 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 blah. Agents are evil. They say, well, I'm not calling you to talk about listing your house. That's not what I'm calling you for. They go, oh, really? No, I'm calling you about selling your house. Are you still interested in selling your house? And then you continue with your original script. Right? How easy is that? So want to hire an agent with an office closer to ours. You know, that's a good one. We can sell our house on our own. We're just testing the market. Nobody's just testing the market. We're taking it off the market for a little while. And here's how I would handle that. We're taking it off the market for a little while. Hey, I understand it's hard having your house, having to have your house ready all the time for showings. If I had a buyer that would give you that $150,000 you're asking for, would you still be interested? Even believe how many of us say yes to that. We're looking for somebody with more experience. Well, 
I hear this a lot with agents in my, in my coaching group. You know, guys, you can always partner up with another agent, right? You can always partner up with somebody with more experience. We're looking for somebody with more experience. Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I understand. I don't not have as much experience as a lot of agents out there. However, I'm aggressive and I would not be working on selling your home by myself. My team I work with, my office I work with, has a tremendous amount of experience. We have over 100 agents there. We sold a thousand houses last year. However many houses you sold, right? I'm not sure you can find someone with that sort of support. You know, I'd like to send you my marketing plan. Right? Easy. Guys, I looked like I was 12 when I first started um, selling real estate. Right? So I had to overcome a lot of those things. You know, I'd like to talk to my spouse before setting an appointment. Hey, I'd like to talk to my spouse before setting an appointment. Hey, no problem. I encourage you to talk to them. I'd like to meet you both. Do they normally work during the day? Yes or no? How about this? My schedule fills up pretty quick. What if I pencil you in blank? If that doesn't work for them, you can call me back and we can figure out what time will. As I'm willing to pay X commission, that's a fantastic one we kind of talked about. We interviewed an agent that offered a lower commission. Now, this is an objection <clears throat> that normally you'd only get it on the phone after an appointment, right? But you might get it. You might get it before, right? Lots of times you'll get it while you're sitting at the kitchen table. So now, here's the thing. There's always an agent out there that's desperate. Let's say, for example, you charge 6%. There's always an agent that'll charge 5 now, there's probably agents that charge four. There's probably some that charge three and a half, right? There's no standard commission. Some of these agents are all over the place. You know, I don't know how someone pay their bills. I don't know how someone pay the real estate stuff, right? Because they drop their commission so low that doesn't even make sense. But that's not discussion today. So we interviewed an agent that offered a lower commission. Well, there are agents that do charge more than we do and some that charge less. Did you compare the, your marketing plan to one I sent? Say, well, yeah, it looks about the same. You know, all you agents do the same thing. Okay, well, what commission rate do they offer? Guys, I'll tell you what. I had one. This was um, this was one um, where the lady told me this exact same scenario here. Exact same scenario. Now, one of the it, one of the weird issues I had there was she wanted 135,000 for her house, and I told her that we could get 149. So, and we sold the house. We ended up selling the house in like two days. So, but I said, "What commission rate did they offer?" And she goes, "Well, they told me they do it for five, and you want six. So what I did, I said, "Hey, well, I tell you what. I said, let me call my broker real quick because you know I like to I like to play the sales game, guys." And now I would not work for an office that did not allow me to adjust my commission as needed sometimes. Now, I'm not saying I'm giving away my service for free because I don't work for free. But, you know, I'd only work for an office that gave me a little, little leeway, right? Now, we're not going out there trying to take, you know, listings at commissions that are way above what the market average is. And we're not trying to take them below, right? But we want to get paid fairly, correct? And we want to get paid. Some agents don't understand getting paid. They will get hung up over the commission rate. There was an agent a while back that told me he would not take a listing under 7%. Right, that's what he told me. It's a conversation we had. But he had zero listings. Okay, so, so therefore, and he was in a hot market. Therefore, you know what? 7% wasn't working out too well for him. He'd been a lot better off, to, hey, he'd been a lot better off to take listings at 5% and have a couple listings, right? So you gotta make a business decision sometimes. I stepped outside. Um, I don't remember who I called, but I called somebody, chatted with them for about three minutes on the phone, went back in. I say, hey, hey, um, so at 5%, you're ready to sign the listing paperwork? She says yes. And you know what? I got a house that sold in two days. Split the commission on MLS 50-50, two and a half and two and a half, and I made two and a half percent versus trying to be, trying to get, you know, 6%, 1% more. You know, man, I made a commission. I made a commission in like 30 days. You know, it's a business decision. That's all it was. I'm not telling you to lower your commission. I'm telling you to do what's best for your cash flow situation, the business that you're in, the business that you're running. Right? So that's a great objection right there. So guys, guys, I've went way over my time here. I'm going to tell you what I am going to. Um, I've got some time here for some question and answer. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Do you guys have any? 
you guys have any questions, I see I got a lot of people on here still listening. Did you guys enjoy the webinar? All right, did you guys enjoy what we talked about tonight? Was this a good one? Was there stuff on there that actually made sense? Was there stuff on there that um that uh, you think is going to help you when you make calls tomorrow? Cool, Charles. You know, I feel like I feel like I hope there was. I feel like I hope there was some stuff on there that helps you, and I feel like I hope there was some stuff on there that um that um made a lot of sense to you guys. And uh, and guys, if I can help you with your business, if there's something that you um something you have going on, something you need that you want to talk to talk uh, about, just let me know. And guys, I really um. Let's see, it's very poised in their lives. Thank you. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it guys. I hope you guys have a good night and um, I will talk to you guys soon. Have a good time.